So, sheep farmer, things are pretty good. You just say, happy days, happy days. Um, and what I'm here to talk to you about, but perhaps we have to think really hard right now about what we do to ensure that we are a premium protein. Basically, my, my discussion you can see there is, is it a commodity or is it a premium protein? Um, and the proposition I'm going to put to you is that our current marketing and transaction systems are going to actually struggle to keep with the consumer expectations. We, we so commonly hear, as we just heard from Pat, that the consumer is king. And, you know, where every component of the value chain is working together to create value. And what I want to look very specifically is the relationship between producer and processor and the signals that we receive and how we play a part in that. And then I'd like to discuss with you how industry is proposing a path forward to fundamentally change how we engage with each other in the supply chain. Okay, um, now I'll go straight to my, th this is my, my office. Um, you can see here to the, to the left, we're, we're feeding a few sheep at the moment. Um, it's a good, good challenge, but big, beautiful red gums. I'm very fortunate where I, where I live and work. Um, work for a, a, a semi-corporate family, family business. And I'll just give you a little bit of background about where I'm coming from in terms of measurement. I uh, actually, I'm not really a farmer. I came down farming about 17 years ago. I actually worked for, for this mob, mob Abear. So it's kind of funny now I'm, I'm here talking at Abear. Um, it was a really cool gig. I'd travel around, around Australia talking to farmers. And you go, oh, I'm from, I'm from the government. Can you give me your profit and loss and your, your balance sheet? I, I could, could never believe how, how open farmers were. Um, and I actually married a, a farming girl, and she kind of convinced me to, to, to do it. But what I learned at that, that time at Abear, farmers are actually really genuine, hard-working people. Um, and also, what I, I had this funny idea. I'd, I'd worked also in wool processing for five years, and then I worked at the agency network Elders, and I thought wool was going to transform itself. Okay? Perhaps I got that a little bit wrong. Um, but actually, my, my premise was, was quite okay. I said... To get abnormal profits, okay, to really do okay, you have to produce a very specific product. And I can see some of you wearing good Italian suits. I reckon Andrew's probably got one on. Um, what I believed really strongly was that, that to get a premium, you had to produce really fine wool um, with really good tensile strength. So those machines could run really quickly um, and, and low vegetable matter. So we set about a really clear goal. We said, okay. Let's, let's have a seven, eight year goal. We've got to produce X amount of quantity of that type of wool. And what I learnt was my, my country actually couldn't do it. But ironically, what I had in the wool industry is what I don't have in the sheep meat industry. I could measure it. At that point, we, we were having in-shed testing and it wasn't that hard. I, you know, you put a tag in a sheep and you can follow a fleece, you can follow an animal and you can set up an individual animal um, identification system and work out what's actually going on. So we kind of went, oh, geez, wool, wool isn't quite the future. And I'll be very honest with you also, we, we were really disappointed by the lack of leadership the wool industry showed when confronted by a fundamental issue that a consumer might worry about something that we do on farm. And it reflects that in wool, I'm here, and there's seven stages between me and the, the consumer. So we can't get, why would they worry about this thing we do called mules in, which is good for the animal, but they'll see it and go, what? Like we, we look at that now and go, kind of glad we've, got, we've moved away and evolved from wool because our industry still hasn't got on top of that. OK, I digress. Um, and, and at the same time, a lot of other producers have actually done what I've done and moved out of wool. Wool prices are up because supply is down. Um, so I'd argue in the sheep meat industry, we have a, a culture of early innovators and adopters that have moved forward, which is good for then what I'd really like to talk to you about. OK, so where am I going? You know, sheep meat is a good, good story. You'll, you'll see on the, um, on the, the vertical axis, our quantity has, has increased, uh, what, what would that be, 60%? Um, and you'll see with the, the orange line and the, the grey line, which is our, our prices, you know, we, we've gone up close to double. So that's quite rare for, for you know, primary production. You know, the nature of, of perfect competition and my behaviour is if I see my farmer make money, my next door neighbour, 
make money, I'll just kind of follow and uh, eventually I'll kind of oversupply and the market works what it, what it does. Our industry has been different and when you actually compare it to other, other broad acre industries, this is um, an index of, of 1994 prices saying where, where's uh, lamb, cattle, wool and, and wheat and you can see we're actually out, outperforming them. So, you know, I come back to happy days, like as a farmer, making good money, things are good. What, what am I even doing talking to you guys about something I'm worried about? So, what is the problem? Um, and I say this to farmers and they go, you're crazy, because we're so attuned to doing this. Um, so, here's what I think it is, and I, I should mention, all of these are, are purely my own thoughts from the Nuffield, anything group that I represent is, is nothing to do with this. So, here's what I think it is. Um, it's our transaction model and our price discovery. It's a just-in-time procurement system that averages prices. Um, and it's actually quite, don't, don't get me wrong, it's quite rational behaviour from both sides of the equation. You, you think about being a processor and you go, wake up and I need 10,000 sheep to run my plant in two days' time. Got 450 people turning out, massive energy costs. Okay, there's a lot of work to go and have relationships with there's 28,000 sheep meat farmers. That'd be a fair bit of, bit of effort. So they can go into a sale yard, buy what they need very quickly. And, um, you know, they might have to pay a bit more to get the supply, but that's okay, they've got supply. So from a processor side, it's quite rational. And also from a, a producer's side, it's quite rational as well. They can offload animals in the event of a drier period. Um, you know, it creates maximum competition. We have restockers in the market that are trying to buy product as well. So it's all about competition. Um, and, and importantly, it does cater for a variety of different, different product types that they can be segregated and, and find market. But when you really stop and think about it, um, oh, going back, you've got to really stop and think. And you go, we're actually stressing the animal. We are... I know every time I bring an animal into my yards, you, you actually stress them. So we are putting all our animals into one spot, stressing them, and also we're bringing all our diseases together. Bring all our diseases and then going, let's get a price. And then we throw those diseases back out. Just on the pure rationality of, as an industry, we have to say, does it really make sense to, to actually hurt the product from an animal welfare perspective and from a biosecurity perspective Perhaps there's another path. I know we've been doing it for really three, four hundred years. It's come from, from Europe. It, it's a physical market to create price. But the problem I have, and it comes back to that point I made about measurement, outside the ebb and flow of supply and demand, which creates higher prices or lower prices on the day, it's very hard for me on farm to actually get any real, real clear signals about quality and about what, what I produce. Back when I did wool, I could go, OK, I produce that fleece, X micron, fleece weight, therefore processor will value it that way. In sheep meat, I, I produce lamb. Um, OK, it's not that hard to work out how to grow a sheep and a lamb and feed an animal, but I'm actually closer to my consumer. 45% of our product is, is consumed in Australia. Yet I've really got no idea whether I'm doing the right job. And it's because our price discovery is averaging through, through sale yards. And you, you might say, well, hey, look, Mick, you, you sell direct. I, I sell all my animals direct. Um, so these sale yard things have got nothing to do with you. Don't, don't worry about them. But the problem is, you, you'll see on this, um, on this one, and it's a little bit, bit complicated, but uh, the, the top box is how many animals are actually produced in, in Australia. And then where do they go? So if you follow that, that red line, um, you'll see then when it gets all the way back to the abattoir, that 66% of their product goes through an abattoir. Recently, that number's actually reduced quite, quite markedly, which is a good, good sign. So fundamentally, though, our price discovery is linked to that sale yard, um, that a processor can't go that far out um, to give price because it comes down to sale yard price. And the processor actually has to be in the sale yard to prevent their competitor buying cheaper product. That's where the market is. Um, so what, what's the alternative? Um, and I've probably spent too much time thinking about this on my Nutfield, uh, and the key thing where I kind of get to, and a lot of, lot of industry does get to, is we move to a value-based payment system. 
um, where effectively we get paid on yield and eating quality. And what we're trying to do is align goals of what the processor wants. They need to try to minimise those labour, energy costs and running their plant. So we, we move away from just pricing a sheep to getting paid on, on the red stuff, the actual lean meat yield or the saleable meat yield. And you, you just see that, that example there where you have two different animals that visually look the same, you actually have quite markedly different, different values to them. Um, so it's just, okay, here's a concept. We go, yep, look, makes sense. Let's um, go to this value-based marketing. And, and the, the proposition of the why to move away from averaging makes pretty good sense. You know, we're aligning goals closer to that consumer value creation point. We can then, and this is my bias perspective because I'm a farmer, we can incentivise my behaviour on farm. I can work out how to, how to feed a sheep, how to get a better quality product. Um, you know, I can link my management together from, from the genetics I use to create a certain outcome. And if I get paid for it, it incentivises me for good behaviour. Um, and importantly for the processor, improving processing efficiency. They basically pay for what, what they can, can get benefit out of. So, you know, the, the theory's kind of in line. How do we do it? It's through objective carcass measurements. We measure it. Um, and you might notice a, a consistent theme in, in my approach to things. I'm kind of going, we've got to measure stuff. It's not that hard. Um, and it might mean that I actually, as a farmer, I kind of measure a lot of stuff because I don't really think I've got the skills to go, yeah, that's good, that's bad. I have to, you know. And I think the rational mind end up, ends up there. So we measure, measure yield through... Um, the current path is through a dual energy X-ray analysis machine, and it gives a far greater accuracy level of 90% compared to, to only 20% when, you, when we manually palpate uh, an animal. Um, so that's kind of the, the processor goal, to get more efficient for, for each carcass, and you've got to think you know, really importantly about the consumer, that it's about eating quality. So for us in the sheep meat industry, it's really looking at intramuscular fat, that consumer goal. Um, so how are we actually going to do it? And this is now the interesting development industries hopefully collaboratively going down. Um, in 2016, MLA announced a, a collaborative investment of $150 million using some of our levies to what I'd call build a, a bridge over the trust divide. That adversarial relationship we have in the sale yards, can we, can we alleviate that by having an independent transparent measurement system with really consistent language. That basically an animal can get killed in any plant in Australia, measure the same way, and we have confidence in it. Um, and then link all that data back on farm through what's called Livestock Data Link. Um, you know, MLA kind of pushed it through. I think naturally the processors go, hey dude, like this is our business, what are you, what are you, what are you doing? Um, and for us as producers, here we are gonna to have to say to producers, hey, you know those guys who you think pull your pants down every time? We'd like to use your levy to put in machines to make them more efficient. It's actually quite an, an innovative approach to solving a problem. And I'm hopeful that it, it's the long-term path. Okay. Um, and but there is a big risk of this DEXA program. If we only focus on yield and we forget about the consumer, we're going to actually hurt our product. The, the pork industry learnt that when they just focus on processing efficiency, they actually hurt their eating quality outcomes. So what we desperately need is eating quality measurement. And it's kind of like the holy grail for the Australian sheep meat industry. Um, and fortunately, we, we do have a, a, a major program called the Advanced Livestock Measurement Technology Group that uh, is doing a, a quite an extensive spend um, of $17 million. And we're hoping over the next two to three years we're going to have that. So, Key thing is, you know, we want to get yield, yep, makes sense, but we need eating quality. So once we've gone down this path of, of putting DEXA machines in all these processing plants, then we very quickly have to have eating quality measurement because we end up hurting our product. So it makes us get somewhere. All right. Governments. Governments generally, as a farmer, I think governments get in my way. But that bureaucracy, that's just painful. Um, I'm a, you can always tell I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a pure kind of capitalist kind of greedy bastard. But ironically, in Victoria, they've actually done, done us a lot of good. That 
the, electronic, the mandatory electronic identification for sheep um, being brought in, it's about traceability and risk management and market access. It's actually going to help objective carcass measurements because if we have every, we move to individual animal man, uh, identification, we can then link every animal killed in the processing back to what I do on farm. Basically, every tag I put in every animal, I know what I've, where the genetics have come from and I know what, what management I have. It changes our whole behaviour on farm. And the, the key point I keep saying is if we get paid for it, then it incentivises us the, the right way. How am I going for time, Serena? Good? OK, nearly there. Well, that's conclusion. That's cool. Um, so if you could just take home one, one key, key message, a collaborative industry investment in DEXA and then eating quality will we'll ensure that we are, are actually a premium protein. Um, and it will do what I call build a, a bridge over the, the trust divide. And you know, the key thing is if we can get price discovery close to the consumer, then we align goals. The eventual path would be to, to go down a providence path. But what will hopefully happen in Australia will be backed up by meat science and eating quality. It won't just be something on a, on a, a brand un, unsubstantiated. Yeah. The eventual path is we all trust each other and contribute in a value chain together. But going back to that, that point I made, 66% of our product for the last seven years, finished product, has gone through a sale yard. That tells you where our industry is at right now. And it's a maturation process. Okay, good? Done. Thank you.